I hope you, you had some rest uh, yesterday night, that you are in good shape this morning. We have to continue our equations. Uh, we, we did a lot yesterday about acoustics. Uh, I introduced part of the problem. Uh, you know, acoustics is, is doing the coupling in, uh, in combustion dynamics. And uh, it is important uh, in many other areas as well. So what you learn on acoustics can be useful to many other things. Uh, so uh, what we do here is of more general use than combustion dynamics. Uh, so what we, uh, just very briefly, I've, I've set up the equations that we derived. So uh, these are the perturbation equations uh, of fluid mechanics. We consider that the fluid uh, is uh, ideal, no viscosity, no conductivity. They do not uh, intervene uh, in acoustic processes except at very high frequencies. Um, and, uh, and so we can neglect these uh, difficult terms like, uh, you know, the uh, viscous terms, uh, the viscous stress tensor, the uh, heat conductivity, we don't have to take care of them. Uh, the equations that we got uh, was this first set. So this is a first order uh, differential equation set, partial differential equations, uh, that can be useful for numerical calculations. It's better to use first order equations. Uh, it is also possible to derive the wave equation. So this is the wave equation uh, that is familiar to you, I hope. Uh, this wave equation governs acoustics but it also governs electromagnetic radiation. So uh, the same equation governs the two, and uh, it's real, it's not, uh, it's, uh, it works. It, uh, it allows you to calculate light, it allows you to calculate electromagnetic waves and acoustic waves as well. It's important to keep the uh, momentum, the linearized momentum equation, because this gives us the boundary conditions, this will be very helpful to set up boundary conditions. For example, if you know that this is a rigid wall, we know that the velocity, the normal velocity against the wall is zero, and this sets up a, a condition on the pressure gradient. So uh, th this equation is, is quite important, has to be kept together with this equation. In addition, uh, yesterday we, we, dem we demonstrated, it was very simple, we demonstrated that the pressure perturbations and the density perturbations were just related by the square root of the speed of sound. The speed of sound itself, of course, uh, who tells us that it's the speed of sound? It is because later on we see that this quantity here becomes this one here, and so as a consequence this has a, uh, plays the role of the speed of sound. And this quantity C is given, C square, is dp by d rho at constant entropy. So if you want to calculate the, the speed of sound, uh, you use this, this expression. And, uh, and for that, you need to know the relation between the pressure, the density, the entropy. And for uh, um, a perfect gas, p is equal to rho gamma e to the s over cv. It's a very very useful expression, uh, and of course here it's useful. So uh, C, CV here is the uh, specific heat per unit mass uh, at constant volume. This is R over gamma minus one, and CP is gamma R over gamma minus one. Uh, R itself is the universal gas constant and divided by the molar mass. And for air, uh, this is, for example, 29 kilogram per kilomole, because air is formed by uh, nitrogen, 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, and when you calculate the molar mass of air, it's 29. So uh, uh, R is, is equal to 287. This is very useful for engineering calculations because you, you need that at this point, so you can immediately calculate things, uh, uh, the density of air, for example, you can obtain that for uh, the given pressure and temperature and so on. And so uh, C square is dp by d rho at constant s, so when you derive this with respect to rho, it gives gamma 
rho gamma minus 1 e s over c v. And this is gamma p over rho. And gamma p over rho using that is gamma rt. So this expression, I think, is familiar to you. You've seen it in fluid mechanics. And if you do compressible fluid mechanics, of course, you get that. So uh, you can evaluate the speed of sound in air. And it's uh, at room temperature, it's 346 meters per second. If the temperature is increasing, the speed of sound increases like square root of uh, the temperature. And this happens in flames because the, the, the temperature in the flame is, uh, is larger. So the, so the speed of sound uh, increases uh, in the combustion region. So now, uh, are there any questions on what we did yesterday that you want to? Uh, did you try to do the homework? Who has been had the courage to do, do the little homework? Complex number arithmetic. Yes, we did also some complex numbers. Yes, I told you that the complex numbers are very important. There, uh, when you do waves, when you you, uh, you you calculate waves, it's important to be able to to use complex numbers. So, what is the is there a difficulty? Is anything? No, it's familiar to you, I think. Uh, even if you are engineers, uh, you, you better know complex numbers. They are, they are not mysterious. Nothing, it's, uh, it looks, you know, when you say it's imaginary. No, it's, uh, it's not. It's, uh, it's, it's a very useful uh, method to, to, uh, to calculate, to do all the calculations that you want. And afterwards, you get to the real world by taking the real value, and that's it. So uh, what we now have to do, uh, up to now, we, we didn't consider any heat release. But combustion is about heat release. The, the, the rate of heat release in the flame is, of course, essential. How much heat is being released by the flame. And we are interested in non-steady heat release. We are, we are interested in what happens because there are fluctuations of heat release. So what what is changing here? The balance of mass is the same. This is the uh, perturbed ba balance of mass. The momentum, there is no heat release in that. Again, it's the same. What is different is the equation of energy written for the entropy. What happens is that now we have on the right-hand side of this equation, yesterday it was zero. So the entropy was constant, everything was uh, just uh, everywhere, the entropy was the same. But today we place here a fluctuation in heat release. This is a, you see it's a fluctuation. We consider the fluctuation. So uh, what, what is uh, happening here? We assume also that uh, the velocity is very small. And so this term is essentially zero. There is no, we, we don't have to uh, consider this term. However, you see here now, we have a, a perturbation in entropy which will arise and the temperature and the density are the, the temperature and density of the medium. And on, the, on this side, we will have just the fluctuation in heat release. So it's a heat release rate fluctuation. In terms of dimensions, uh, this is a, an energy uh, divided by a volume and, uh, and, uh, and by time. Uh, yeah. So it's the heat energy released per unit volume, per unit time. This is a fluctuation. And we want to know uh, its effects for uh, for acoustics, what sort of acoustics will come out of this source term. And so uh, we, we start with this system. So this is the system that we, we begin with. And, and now uh, we cannot say that S1, the entropy is, is zero, as we, we did before. We have a perturbation in entropy. And as a consequence, when we look at the equation of uh, P is equal to P of rho and S, uh, this can be differentiated, and we have dp is equal to dp over d rho at constant s d rho plus dp over ds at constant rho 
ds. And in terms of perturbations, this tells us that p1 is equal to dp over d rho at constant s. It's c square rho 1 plus, now there is a new term, alpha. I'm going to call this alpha, and it's s1. So the, the, the main difference uh, from yesterday is now that we have a, uh, the density here uh, and the perturbation in entropy will give the pressure. And, and finally, what we can say is that rho 1 is equal to P1 over C squared minus alpha S1, the perturbation in entropy, divided by C squared. So that's, uh, this is the result. And, uh, and now we can take that result and put it in the equation, the, the balance equation, uh, the, the mass balance. And if we do that, you see the mass balance is d rho 1 by dt. So here we have d, d by dt of p1 over c square and minus alpha over c square s1 plus rho 0 divergence of v1 is equal to 0. And that equation becomes 1 over c squared. So we, we find again the same terms as before, plus rho 0 divergence of v1. But now we have a new term which contains the entropy, which is alpha over c squared s1, ds1 over dt. And this term, we, we now use the fact that rho 0, t0, ds1 over dt is equal to q dot 1. And so this, this is just alpha over rho 0, t0, c square, uh, multiplied by uh, dq1. So the heat release, the non-steady heat release, comes in uh, uh, with respect. Uh, it's the derivative. It's the time derivative of this non-steady heat release, which comes in and acts like a source term. So the the whole uh, this uh, the influence of these fluctuations in uh, in uh, in heat release will will be reflected in this equation here. So this is what is shown here. So what we see here, again, you see uh, P1 can be written in, in this form. Alpha is, is a coefficient that we can calculate. It's very easy. You see alpha is P over CV. And, uh, and then once we, we do that, we put rho 1 is equal to 1 over C squared P1 minus alpha over C squared S1. We, we put that in the balance of mass, and this term can be written on the right-hand side and can be ex made explicit in terms of q dot 1. And finally, we get that expression, which is also reproduced in the slide. So, so this, this is the main difference. Uh, yesterday, we had 0 here, and today we now have a source term, which is the heat release rate uh, right here, it's the perturbation in heat release rate. Now, what is alpha? We, we found, so alpha is the derivative of P by S at constant rho, and uh, what we see is that uh, we know that P is equal to rho gamma e to the S over CV. So when we derive that, we find uh, 1 over Cv times rho gamma e to the s over Cv. So it's just p divided by Cv. And the coefficient which comes in there all the time, and you will see it. So, so this is why I'm rederiving that here. Alpha is equal to, uh, so, so the coefficient is alpha over rho 0 t0 c squared. 
So uh, this is P divided by CV uh, divided by rho zero T zero and there is one over C squared. And, uh, and so this can be written as the pressure divided CV is R over gamma minus one times rho zero T zero. And we see that R rho zero T zero and P, this is one, so it makes gamma uh, one over C squared. So it's gamma minus one over C squared. So this coefficient which comes in front of that expression, you see this, uh, this little coefficient here is gamma minus one divided by C squared. So this is how the heat release rate fluctuations will change things in, in, the, uh, in terms of acoustics. So it's, 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 a, it's a simple calculation again. It's nothing very fancy here, but it's very, very important because uh, it will relate the heat release rate fluctuations to the pressure. This is the, the relation between the two. We will see that uh, this is very useful. All right, so uh, this is what is done here. Yeah, what is done here is now, now we have that equation for mass. This is the equation for the momentum. And we can combine them and obtain a, uh, a, a wave equation. But now we have on this side a, a source term. And you see the source term. This equation is so beautiful that I put a red and a, a, a yellow. And so it's really, unfortunately, in your notes, everything is in black and white. But I try to make it aesthetic as well. <laughs> so you see that this is the equation which governs the pressure field in, in, a, in a medium where you have heat release fluctuations. So that, that's really important because you have heat release fluctuations, this will produce pressure. You, you will see a lot of experiments like that. I have a number of things to show you where this term is actively producing a, a peak. So that, that's the, uh, the, the basic equation in reactive flows. Uh, now, uh, w one thing that we can do is look at the compact flame because very often the wavelength is large. For example, if you are at 100 Hertz, the wavelength is three meters. 1000 is 30 centimeters, but the flames are usually smaller. So basically, uh, the flames are very often compact. You can consider that the, the region of combustion is compact compared to the wavelengths. So this is very useful. Uh, and, and so if you, say, uh, if you say, well, let's consider a compact flame, something which is really uh, localized, and we want to, uh, to try to, to get something So we start with the, uh, the idea is to, is to see if we can write a, uh, a jump condition across the compact flame and relate the, the field on the two sides to the heat release rate fluctuations. So we assume a compact flame and we have a volume which surrounds this flame. Let's assume that the flame, uh, we, we make it as a, as a line because it's compact compared to the wavelengths. And um, so what we know is that one over C square dP1 by dT plus rho zero divergence of V1 is equal to, uh, so the coefficient there is alpha over rho zero T zero, uh, one over C square. Uh, and uh, we have uh, just uh, Q dot one. And, and we, we, we saw that this coefficient is just gamma minus one over C square Q dot one. The heat release rate here, fluctuations in heat release rate. So uh, what we do is we take the integral of that over this volume. So we integrate, so it makes 
integral of the first term, dp1 by dt dv. And we integrate the second term, rho zero, uh, v, uh, divergence of v1. Uh, and uh, let me see, yeah. Sorry, I, I have to divide first by rho zero. I, I will tell you why. So first of all, we divide by rho zero, like that. And then, uh, and this works, dv is equal to uh, sum of gamma minus one over rho zero c square and q dot one dv. Okay, so, uh, and now the, the reasoning is as follows. Let's assume that the, velo the, the volume here is very small. So we, we make it very, very small. As a consequence, this quantity here will be in the limit of very small volume will be zero. So this will tend to zero. The second one, we, we know the, uh, the green theorem and we know that a quantity like divergence of a, of a field, let's say V here, dV, is equal to the, uh, uh, to the flux of V uh, through the surface. It's the divergence theorem. So uh, this quantity here will be equal to the area S2. Let's say, let's assume that this is two, this is one. So you have an area on this side. This area might not be equal to the S1 area. So, and on that side, we have the velocity V2. And now I'm going to represent the fluctuations with the, with the con, with the, and minus S1 V prime one. So this has the velocity fluctuations on the two sides in the normal direction. And on the other side, what we have is gamma minus one. Now, rho zero C square, this quantity is gamma P. You see rho zero C square. If you look back here, rho zero C square is gamma P. So, and the pressure in combustion doesn't change much in the combustion region. This is true for deflagrations, for combustion, the, the usual combustion that we use, but of course it, it isn't true for detonations, but we are here interested in more uh, the, 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 the very standard uh, industrial applications of combustion. And essentially the combustion is isobaric. Not quite, but very, there are very little changes in, in terms of pressure. So rho zero C square is constant. That's uh, fortunate. Like that, we don't have to worry about the changes in, in the density across the flame and so on. No, in this case, rho zero C square is gamma P is a constant. So we can extract that from the integral. It doesn't change, it's here. So you can use it from the upstream side or the downstream side, and you have q dot one. So the, uh, it's, sorry, the integral of q dot one. And I call that big q dot one, because now it's a, it's a volume integral uh, of the heat release. It's the, uh, like that, all right? So q, q dot one is like that, q dot one is equal to the sum of q dot, small q dot one dv. So that, that's very nice because now we have a, an expression which tells you the relationship between the two velocities on the two sides of the flame uh, and their relation to the heat release fluctuation, to the uh, integral of the heat release fluctuation. This is what is done here. It's, uh, again, this reasoning is there perhaps clearer because it's bigger. Um, so th this is a, a jump relation. Yes? Oh, is that the precise term of the gradient? Because the volume is very small. But gradient sometimes could be large and small gradient. 
Oh, but, uh, well, no, what you can assume is that the pressure is oscillating, so you have a, fr uh, uh, a frequency in front of the pressure. So you have the pressure times the frequency, and, uh, but if the volume is collapsing to zero, uh, it goes to zero. So this term uh, vanishes because the volume vanishes. It's a finite term multiplied by a vanishing volume, so it, it vanishes. The dp, the d by dt is like a frequency multiplied by the pressure then, so fp. So for example, you have two pascals multiplied by 1,000, so it makes uh, uh, 2,000 something. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, pressure divided by time. And, uh, but then you integrate that over a volume which is very small. And this is how you, you, you get uh, jump conditions, you know, relating upstream and downstream. So here we now have a, an expression for this. This is, a, this, this is extracted from this equation. It's a, it's a very useful expression again. We, we do, you will see, we do a lot of calculations with this expression. So this expression writes as follows. So we, if you have a compact flame, you can actually verify that. It's, uh, it's, it's even possible to, to, to have that verified. So S2, the, the area on the, on the downstream side, V prime 2 minus S1, V prime 1, is equal to gamma minus 1 over rho 0 C squared, in fact, gamma p, you can write that gamma p, q dot 1. And this q dot 1 is the integral of the heat release fluctuation in the flame. So that, that's really a, a nice expression. And uh, we will use that by introducing a transfer function. For example, uh, flames can be submitted, so let's assume that you have the, this compact flame here, it's a black box, and here you have velocity fluctuations. You, you, you produce velocity fluctuations and, and you want to see what, what does the flame do. And so here you get heat release fluctuations. And, uh, and, and so how do, does one characterize something like that? For example, using a transfer function. You can say, here is a transfer function, a function of angular frequency, perhaps a few other things. And uh, this will be the heat release fluctuation in the flame divided by, it's nice to use uh, dimensionless quantities. Uh, so, we, we divide that by the heat release, the mean heat release rate. All of these are rates. And then we divide that by, by the input. Now the input is V prime one. And, uh, and of course, all of that happens in flows. But again, the, the velocity in, in the combustors are not very large. You don't have uh, too large velocity. So as a consequence, for all the calculations that we did, we neglected the mean velocity. But here, it is now interesting to, to use the mean velocity uh, to measure the fluctuations with respect to the mean. But uh, in the equations, again, we neglected V0. We, we didn't uh, use any mean velocity because they have a minor effect on acoustics. It's not a major effect. So, uh, so we can characterize uh, the, the, uh, the, the response of the flame in terms of this transfer function and, uh, and, and a good definition of that. One, one could also use a different one. For example, you could use Q dot one divided by V prime one, that's it. But it's nicer to, to have something dimensionless. It's nicer also for experiments. You, we will see that because you can measure this mean heat release, you have the fluctuation, you divide one by the other, it's meaningful already. You know how much heat release fluctuation is taking place. 
heat release rate fluctuation. Uh, velocity is the same. It's interesting to measure the fluctuation with respect to the mean. So th this is a reasonable uh, expression. So when we do that and we, we put that into this expression, uh, we now have a, a jump condition which tells us uh, how the flame responds to incoming perturbations. And this is uh, cast in the form or as a function of this, uh, of this uh, transfer function. So what comes out is, so let's assume now that S2 is equal to S1, just, but you, of course you can work it out uh, with the different uh, areas. Let's assume that you have a plane flame and you, S2 is equal to S1. So the, the surface multiplied by the change in the velocities is equal on this side to gamma minus one. So that's a parameter. It's just a, something that you can di directly uh, calculate. And, uh, and now we have Q dot, we have this quantity coming in there. So um, this will be um, uh, F times Q dot one bar divided by um, V one bar and V prime one. So uh, little by little, we get just an expression between the velocities on the upstream side and the downstream side. And we have uh, the, the remainder are basically coming from the flame and uh, this, this is a parameter. And we have now an expression which is pretty, in pretty good shape for uh, various purposes. So let's see uh, how it goes. So again, this is what I just did. Uh, we introduced this transfer function. You, you, you've been using transfer functions uh, in control systems. Uh, when you study linear systems, this is a typical tool for engineering. You use transfer functions. Uh, so uh, we write Q dot. You, you see here the one I replaced by a, by a comma, but it's, it's, you, you can either way. You know, sometimes it's one and sometimes it's, uh, but because there is a, here one is, uh, is the upstream, two is downstream. So this is why I changed to primes, you know, put the primes here. Still, I, I should have changed it to prime here, but well, the two notations are here. There are no ambiguities here. So uh, you see this expression. And now if you look carefully at the right-hand side, it can be, uh, it can be uh, uh, made more explicit as follows. First of all, you say Q dot bar is equal to the mass flow rate times Cp times Tb minus Tu. Tb is the downstream temperature, the bond gas, Tu upstream. And uh, if you look at rho zero C square S over V, which comes in at the bottom of this, uh, you see, uh, oh, and the, the surface here, let's put it on this side here. Where is it? So one sees that here, rho zero times S times V bar is the, the mass flow rate that goes through the flame. So you, you see the M dot is here. So on the, on the bottom here, you see M dot times C square. And, uh, and on the top, we have M dot Cp Tb minus Tu. And, uh, uh, and C square itself is gamma R Tu, for example. So when you look at this expression, the M dot is going away. Cp is equal to gamma R over gamma minus one. So this one is gamma R over gamma minus one. The R goes away with this one. The gamma will go away. And we have finally 
Uh, and the gamma minus one goes away with that one. So finally we get Tb minus Tu over Tu. So it's, uh, it, it, uh, it comes to a very simple expression where this is just replaced by, again, this, this one, which is at the, so, uh, so we get something really simple. You know the temperatures on the two sides of the flame and, uh, and this relates the velocities V prime two minus V prime one is equal to, uh, to the uh, flame transfer function, which is a, a function of the frequency of the angular frequency times Tb minus Tu minus one and times V prime one. And this is a, a dimensionless quantity. So, so now you can, if you know this transfer function, and we can measure actually such transfer functions, you have an idea of what goes on, uh, the influence of the heat release fluctuations through the transfer function on the velocity field. And this is, so the, the whole problem is replaced by the simplest one. Uh, you have this very simple matching condition jump condition. Uh, it is also possible now to look at the balance of energy. You remember yesterday we did a balance by multiplying one equation uh, by P1 and the other equation uh, you take the scalar product by V1 and what you get on the, on the left hand side you get the derivative of the energy, the acoustic energy density. Then uh, P and V form a flux. You have the divergence of the flux P1, V1. And now the, the new thing, and we had zero on the, on the other side, but now we have a source term, and the source term appears as the product, this is the local source term, the product of P1 times the heat release rate fluctuation, Q1, Q.1. So this is, it gives you the balance of energy in a, in a reactive system. It, it tells you how the acoustic energy will increase or decrease in such a system. Of course, if you have fluxes going out of the system, the energy will decrease. Uh, if you have, on the other hand, if P1Q.1 is positive, this will increase the, the acoustic energy. So if the pressure and the heat release uh, are in, in, a good, uh, uh, in, in a good relation, they will make this energy grow. And uh, if they are in another one, uh, it, it will decay. So this, is a, uh, this balance of acoustic energy is very, very uh, instructive. Uh, it, it takes this shape. Uh, I told you yesterday that it's very similar to the pointing vector, the pointing theorem. Uh, in the pointing theorem, what, yes? I just want to make sure that I understand correctly. This F is different from the transfer function. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, yeah. It's a vector here. Uh, yes, from time to time there are ambiguities. I'm sorry for that. Uh, you have the transfer function, so keep it there. And, and this is the flux. This is the acoustic flux. Uh, it's too bad. Yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah, sometimes... Uh, because there are only uh, a limited number of letters and otherwise you, you would have to take the Greek letters we already use and some people even use uh, others, perhaps Chinese uh, uh, letters. That, there, there, there could be a lot of more uh, symbols. No, but basically, yes. So here it's the flux. So what you have is the, uh, it, and it takes the, uh, a, a conservation form. You, you see this? This is the typical conservation form. You, the, the quantity is the energy density, the acoustic energy density. The flux is the uh, P1, V1. This is the flux of acoustic energy. And then on the right-hand side, you have a source term. And, uh, and what is missing is, of course, that there are dissipation terms. Uh, anyway, in this room, for example, uh, there are some dissipation taking place, especially uh, on the boundaries because of uh, absorbing material, something. So you do have, in, in all systems, you have dissipation. 
And again, in mechanical systems, this is the hardest part of the problem. You don't know exactly what is the dissipation, but the oscillations always decay. They, they never stay at a, uh, if you have a system, uh, there are uh, dissipative terms. It's uh, more difficult to determine these dissipative terms. So what we do is just to say, well, there is a damping there. Uh, there is some damping that you can measure. Let me just give you, so that we don't do only equations, how does one measure the damping in a, in a system? So for example, the typical way of doing that is the following. You take a Of course, we have to, to determine this damping. The damping is very important. How much damping is, is in the system uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is of importance. It's not negligible. So typically, for example, we have a, we have a burner here. This is a, a laboratory burner. And we put a microphone at the bottom here. Let's say, let's call it M1. And then we put a loudspeaker here. And we put a microphone. Oh, this one is M0. And this is M1. And you have this system which resonates and you want to know what is the damping of this system. What do you do? You, you put here a sinusoid at the frequency F uh, you take the signal at the microphone, which is like that, and you take the signal, this is a reference signal that tells you the level of oscillation uh, close to this, and you have the signal at, this, uh, at the bottom here. And now what, what you can do is just take the, uh, the, the level of the signal at M0, so P at M0, divide by the level of the signal at M1, because this will change as you change the frequency, the loudspeaker may not be quite uh, flat as a response. And you say, uh, this, is a, uh, uh, this will be plotted as a, uh, as a function of frequency. So let's plot that as a function of frequency. And this system will show a, a certain response like that. So this is the, the resonance, one of the resonances. And if you look at this, so this is the, at halfway, uh, uh, you have the peak here and you, you go at one half here, you measure delta F and you have a, what is called a, here again, the, uh, we use the letter Q. <laughs> it's the quality factor which is F0 divided by delta F. If you, you have a system which is extremely resonant, uh, you will have something like that. It will be very, a very thin peak, and so delta F will be very small. On the contrary, if the system is, uh, is damped, well, uh, Q will be smaller. So in this case, uh, Q can be very, very large. It's the, this quality factor uh, describes the resonance. So if the resonance is very strong, Q is large, delta F is very small. And on the other hand, if the, the system is highly damped, what you see is something which looks like that. And, and so delta F is big here and this resonance is very small. So by just measuring delta F, you have an idea of the damping. So delta F gives you the damping. And in fact, you can uh, get uh, the expression, the, the damping itself, let's call it xi, for example, is proportional to delta F. So, uh, so this is how you, we, we, we can measure damping. We, we measure damping. And uh, it's a simple experiment. You can mount that. You take a, a resonance system, put a microphone. You even, well, it's better to, to use this ratio because it's more meaningful. For example, if the loudspeaker 
is reducing its level, you take that into account with this microphone. Have this microphone. Any question on that? Yes. Yes. Is it a source term? Or no, no, I, I was telling about D, because okay. up to now we didn't say much about damping, but damping is here, there is damping. Uh, damping is uh, in mechanical systems, in electrical systems, you, as you have resistances, you have damping, and in, uh, in acoustic systems, you have damping. For example, in this room, if I put a, uh, a sound, if there were no damping, this sound would be here forever. But but of course there is damping. As soon as I sp stop, stop speaking, sound is decayed. So, so there is damping. So, uh, so we have to take that into account. Uh, systems are damped and in fact, uh, one of the, the goal is to, to have a sufficient amount of damping to, to be above the source terms. And this is what is expressed uh, so, how does one express that in more mathematical form? We take this, the previous expression, and we integrate that over a period. So, this is what is shown here. You take the average over a period of oscillation. Uh, let's assume that you have an oscillation, and so you take the average over the period of oscillation. So, all the terms now are average over periods. For example, you have a, the instantaneous terms. You remember the, the energy density is equal to 1 over 1 half P1 square over rho 0 C square plus one half rho zero V1 square. The flux F is equal to P1 V1. And uh, the, the source term S is equal to gamma minus one over rho zero C square P1 Q dot one. So we now the first thing we do, we take the average over a period, one over t over the period of this expression E dt. We take the average because it's more, uh, the instantaneous is not so important. What is important is on the average what happens. F is the is the uh, the heat flu the the <laughs> the uh, acoustic flux average over a period, one over t. P1, V1, uh, DT, and it's a vector. And then we take the average of S, so now big S is equal to uh, this, this S, like that. Um, again, averaged over a period. And uh, by doing that, we can still have changes in, in these quantities as a function of time. So what we have is that dE by dt, these are slower changes. Uh, of course, we had the oscillation, which is a high, uh, high speed change. Uh, then we have divergence of f. And on the, on the right hand side, we have s. This is the average of, of the source term of uh, energy and the average over the period of the damping. So now the balance is between these four terms. You see, uh, you may have some fluxes, you may have some source terms due to this interaction between acoustics and combustion, and you have some damping. Uh, damping is usually obtained from measurements or, or more or less uh, known because of uh, experience. And there are other ways, uh, anyway. So, and now what we do is we take the, the volume, we, we integrate that over the volume of interest. So what we have now, it will be a balance for the whole volume. 
you consider the whole volume where combustion is taking place. Uh, for example, the, the combustion uh, chamber, and you write a balance of energy, of acoustic energy in this chamber. This can be, for example, the, the thrust chamber of a rocket you have here. So you, you consider, for example, this volume. So this could be the volume on which you integrate, V. So what does it say? It says that the, uh, the energy over the volume, so d by dt of the integral of the energy over the volume. Plus, when we do the integration of, uh, over the volume, we have the fluxes coming in, the divergence of the flux, but this can be replaced by the integral of the flux across the surface of this volume, the control surface A. So sometimes there are no fluxes because this is, for example, a wall. There is no flux here because the velocity is zero. So absolutely no flux. But th there can be a flux, acoustic flux, going out through the nozzle here. And then we have on, the, on this side the integral over the volume of gamma minus 1 rho 0 c square p1 q dot 1 dv. And then we have the integral of all the damping taking place in the volume. And, uh, and so what we see, let's assume, for example, that the fluxes are zero, that the box is really, no acoustic flux uh, goes out. Everything is closed, and there is no acoustic flux. Then the energy will increase if this term is bigger than this one. So you see if, the, if this integrated term SDV is greater than DDV, you will have a growth of the acoustic energy and, and so the oscillation will become bigger. And on the other hand, if, uh, if we are, so this is energy is growing. And uh, the contrary takes place as dV. So if the damping is sufficient, uh, it will prevent the growth of energy. And, and this will be like that. So, so the, the, uh, uh, the, competing, the competition here is between the damping and, and, the, uh, and the source term. This is expressed here. So again, that, that is just the reasoning. I kept the fluxes, because some of these fluxes may, may be important. And, uh, and so you, you, have a, you have an expression. And so when does the source term uh, drive the oscillation, drive the instability? When P and Q, you see when you look at, uh, at the terms, uh, you see when P and Q are in phase, when, when there is a, uh, uh, when, when the pressure is in phase with the heat release fluctuation, or when the heat release fluctuation is in phase with the pressure, then there is driving. This is so-called the Rayleigh criterion. Rayleigh uh, demonstrated that. I don't remember exactly how, but he got that result. You know, it's like when you are on a, on a, uh, uh, on a how do you call that? Uh, Swing. On the swing, on the swing. When do you, how, how do you make the swing go uh, uh, higher? You put your, your, your legs uh, up when you go this direction and under when you go that direction. Up, under. It's the same here. You, uh, you, you make heat release when the pressure goes higher and you uh, diminish the heat release when the pressure goes lower. And this is the Rayleigh criterion. Now, Rayleigh didn't uh, use a balance of energy and so on, but you see here it's, it, it can be obtained like that. You see, this is the Rayleigh criterion. The Rayleigh criterion tells you that if the pressure and the heat release are in phase during the cycle, uh, it will drive the oscillation. But that's not enough. It has to be larger, this term has to be larger, the, the term there, S, has to be larger than the damping. 
the, the integrated uh, term has to be larger than the damping. So this is more precise. This is, uh, the, the, in, in general, uh, the, 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 the Rayleigh criterion is uh, always, we look, uh, we look for that. We know the pressure by using a microphone. We know the heat release by looking at the, uh, for example, the intensity of uh, chemiluminescence, which is uh, a reasonable representation of the heat release uh, uh, in the flame. And, uh, and we see that, uh, and we can actually plot uh, um, Rayleigh criterion indices. In fact, you, you calculate this term and you plot it uh, because you take an image of the flame and, and you see regions where R can be above zero and regions where R can be below zero. But if you have a lot of regions above zero and if the damping is not too large, then instability takes place. Uh, before going to these equations, perhaps let me show you a film which, is, which will make these ideas more concrete. Uh, so this is it. So le let me uh, tell you what, what that is. So this is a, a Bunsen flame. It's a conical flame. And uh, what we did is to place a loudspeaker at the bottom here. So that, that's a loudspeaker, and we send a, an oscillation to the loudspeaker. Uh, in the middle here, there is, a, uh, there is a rod. So the flame can stabilize in various ways. One way is to have a conical flame. The other way is to, is to have a, a flame which is attached in the middle, a V-flame. <coughs> this is premixed. Again, uh, you send methane plus air. And uh, the third possibility is to have the flame stabilized uh, on the rod and also stabilized on the, on, the, uh, on the lips here. So, uh, so the, this, this is what we call an M flame. This is a V flame, and this is a conical flame. And, uh, and so we excite with the loudspeaker, and you will see that these various flames respond to the oscillations in different uh, ways. So let's, let's look at the film. So uh, I'll take my microphone to, or maybe, I, yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. All right, so uh, now the, the, the little, uh, the, the rod in the center will do some perturbations so the flame is not quite smooth as a, uh, as a conical flame. It's, you see, this is it. So you hear some, a little bit of noise. There is no excitation here. And now, you see. This is excited at 150 hertz. Uh, you can see that the flame is uh, sensitive to this excitation. Uh, there are motions here, but and now we change to the M flame. And this M flame is now much more uh, susceptible to oscillations. This is the V flame. And you see the V flame uh, is also uh, sending waves. There is a uh, heat release fluctuations here. But the best in terms of uh, noise is the M flame. And if we take out the excitation, this flame uh, doesn't produce any sound. So uh, what we see here is that the flame is very susceptible to perturbations. The geometry of the flame, everything else is kept constant, but the geometry. Did you see the, the magical stick 
this is uh, Daniel Durox, my colleague. You know, just put the stick and you change the flame shape. So for, for, first of all, you have to see that flames are not unique. Uh, you cannot prove a, a mathematical theorem saying uh, the unicity of flames. No, for the same conditions, you can have three types of flames. Uh, the conditions have not changed and you have three types of flames and it depends on how you, you, uh, you, uh, you operate uh, to get one flame or the other or the third one. The second is that when you have an, a conical flame, it is not too, uh, uh, it, it is susceptible to the oscillation, to the, what we put in, but uh, doesn't radiate much sound. The second one, the M-flame, is very susceptible and radiates a lot of sound, so the, the transfer function is strong in this case. There is a gain here. And the third one, there is no uh, loop here. It's just the, the transfer function that we characterize. The third one, the V-flame, is in between. It's uh, sensitive, uh, it produces sound. Uh, you've seen that uh, the sound that it produces has many wavelengths, uh, many frequencies, not a single frequency. So it's nonlinear, and, uh, and it, but it's less sensitive than the, the M flame. So the worst case is the M flame in this case. The geometry is very important. The geometry of the flame has a, has a very important as, uh, effect here. So what, what we've seen here is just these equations operating. So everything, uh, what, what is uh, apparent here is, can be described by what I've just uh, presented previously. All right, let's stop until 11, if you wish. Uh, until, no, sorry, until 10, <laughs> until 10. <laughs> this is just uh, the beginning, all right. Yes. Oh, okay. This one is, is not as loud. Of course, the, the, uh, you would hear it better uh, with the microphone direct. Uh, this one is very loud. And you see, it's not only 150 hertz, it's many frequencies. And no excitation, everything is stopped. So we will see that. Uh,